Okay, I think we're we can okay. get going. Still a few people joining us, but uh, why don't you kick us off, Mew? No problem. Okay. Well, welcome you all to tonight's uh, Dr. Dick Spring's uh, lecture in social policy. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge that this event and our school are situated on the traditional ancestral and ancestral territory of the Hankun Minam speaking Musqueam peoples. Building upon the foundation of social justice and, and ethic of care, the UBC Vancouver School of Social Work is a community of learners actively engaged in the development of critical transformative knowledge of social work practice. To be critical and transformative, we need to be reflexively aware of our history and correct the mistakes that we made. For a long time, racism has uncritically been impacted in the social fabrics of the Canadian society. While the governments have been adjusting the past wrong doings against many racial minority groups, Black Canadians are owned with reparations for the harms endured during the enslavement and the harmful impacts that continues to haunt the Black and communities in Canada. Tonight, we have the honor to have Senator Wanda Thomas Bernard to be with us and to share with us her perspective of an often asked questions. How do we engage in meaningful reparations? Tonight's lecture will be moderated by my dear colleague, Dr. Stinton, uh, a professor of our school and the director of the Canadian Institute for Inclusions and Citizenship. Before that, I would like to invite Dr. Patsy George, the past president of the United Nations Association in Canada, Vancouver branch, which is also our community partners of the Spring Lecture. Uh, we will invite Dr. George to introduce the background of the Dick Spring Lecture. Dr. George. You're uh, Patsy, muted, you're mute. Patsy. <laughs> Praise of the decade. You're there on you mute. <laughs> yes, I am Patsy George and unmuted now. Yes, I am representing the United Nations Association in Canada, Vancouver branch, a partner in sponsoring this annual event. I'm also speaking from downtown Vancouver and acknowledge that this is the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, namely Squamish, Musqueam, and Slavertooth nations. In September of 20, 2006, when Dr. Splain turned 90 years old, those of us who knew him and respected his contribution to Canada, the United Nations and the Global South decided to organize an annual lecture on social policy to honor him. Thus, the first lecture started in 2007. And this year, we are marking the 16th year until his death in 2015, at age 100, Dick blessed us with his presence and encouragement to continue these lectures and discussions. Who was Dick Splain? Born in Alberta with a degree from McMaster at Toronto and London School of Economics, he not only served as a pilot during the Second World War in England, but became assistant deputy minister with the federal government in Canada. He was the chief proponent of Canada Assistance Plan, which provided 50% of the funds to the provinces for health, education, and social services. Dick became a professor of international development upon retirement from public service with special interest in the global south. He served on the board of UNICEF, Mosaic, World Federalist Movement, and of course, served as the president of our own branch here, the United Nations Association. So I think it is time for me to acknowledge the presence of the current co-president of UNAC Vancouver, Samir, who is also a member of the planning committee of this event. And I also want to say hello to our board members from our organization. A special hello to all of those who are with us today, who are friends and colleagues of both Dick and Verna, who have encouraged us to continue these annual events. As a policy expert, a social policy expert, Dick chose the route of public service and academic work to make Canada a better place for ordinary people, 
people with special needs, seniors, the unemployed, and newcomers. He truly believed in engaging the public, particularly the students, in public policy discussions where issues of social justice, human rights, and peace were debated. He believed that we can and we must influence the public policy development in our country. During the last 15 years of these lectures, we have been able to focus on a number of policy issues close to Dick's heart, namely immigration, poverty eradication, human rights, pension reform, indigenous people of Canada and the need for reconciliation, homelessness, policies to protect children locally and globally, hunger and food security issues, seniors and health policies related to caring for them. Today, we are fortunate to learn from Senator Bernard, focusing on structural racism and social policy issues coming out of the United Nations International Decade for people of African descent. Both Dick and Werner Splain promoted the notion of public policy, which included both economic and social policies. Economic policy without social development will not bring equality and justice, they taught us. Dick's legacy will remain the way he was instrumental in shaping the Canadian social policy. We need people with Dick's vision and those these social policy discussions are ongoing on an ongoing basis. When many Canadians and politicians were grateful recently that the federal government agreed to provide 32% of the share of the health cost, I wondered what Dick Splain would have said since he was the main negotiator when the federal government gave 50% through Canada Assistance Plan. So many of us are grateful that Dick lived among us and promoted progressive social policies. May he and Werner rest in peace. Thank you. Tim, back to you. Thank you, Patsy. Uh, and just uh, Mu in his usual humble way didn't introduce himself. Uh, Professor Chan, uh, Professor Yan is the uh, pro tem director of the School of Social Work. Uh, it's it's a really great pleasure to 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 welcome the Honorable Senator Thomas Wanda Thomas Bernard to join us tonight. She's been well known as one of the preeminent social work academics in the country for for decades, uh, but has gone on to uh, to be the first African Nova Scotian woman appointed to the Senate of Canada. Senator Bernard champions issues impacting African Canadians and people living with disabilities. She is particularly invested in human rights, employment equity, and mental health. Through her involvement with community projects, her social work career, and her time at the Dalhousie School of Social Work, she now works in the Senate. Senator Bernard has maintained her deep dedication to social justice and racial justice. So I'm really pleased that, that she agreed to join us tonight. She has a very busy schedule, as I'm sure you can imagine. Uh, but I think it's particularly useful for us on the west coast here we don't we don't have a lot of dialogue and discourse around black canadians um and so we're really pleased that we can uh, we can in a small way begin to remedy that that in our province although being virtual we may have people from around around the country so without further ado it's my great pleasure to to welcome senator Bernard and turn it over to her. Thank you so much, uh, Tim. I really appreciate your, your very warm uh, welcome. I'm joining you this evening from Ottawa and I acknowledge that I'm on the Ishinanabe Algonquin territory, unceded territory. And of course, my home is Nova Scotia, which is the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Mi'kmaq people. So I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I want to thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yan, Dr. George, Dr. Stanton, and colleagues for inviting me to talk about this, this topic. Well, if we could put up the PowerPoint, that would be great. Uh, talking about this, this title, I think is so very important, looking specifically at reparations in social work. <clears throat> 
and a model for change. And so when I sort of thinking about reparations and social work from the perspective of people of African descent, we'll go to the next slide, please. What I want to do this evening then is talk a bit about reparations. Um, and I'll talk about how I bring the topic of reparations into my work in the Senate. And the, the United Nations decade for people of African descent um, will end next year. So we're in, in year nine of those 10 years. I want to highlight those uh, pillars, those three pillars, and then talk about the model, the model that the Association of Black Social Workers in Nova Scotia engaged with the Canadian Association of Social Workers did, the, rec the recommendations. But then I want to talk about how we enact reparations, not only within social work, but beyond. So we'll go to the next slide. If we think about reparations as meaningful action and thinking about meaningful action for past harms. And so many of you, I'm sure on the West Coast, you're very familiar and, and doing a lot of work around with, with uh, indigenous communities and a lot of work around uh, reconciliation. Reparations would be very similar. And the key point there would be around meaningful action. As a Senator, we have three primary responsibilities. We educate. And so part of that work that we do is educating. We do a lot of work in schools. We do work you know, within the K to 12, but also in colleges and universities, but also community education. So we do a lot of public speaking engagements. We study uh, issues. And this evening, just before coming here, I was part of the uh, Senate. I'm the deputy chair of the Senate Human Rights Committee, and we're currently studying Islamophobia in Canada. That study is nearing an end. It's been going for about a year. Uh, so, you know, really important issues. And we legislate. So that's a big part of our work as well. And I'm proud to say to this social work audience that I bring my social work lens to all of that work. And uh, part, of, part of that work is bringing forward the, the, the idea and the ideals around reparations, looking at reparations for uh, past harms, but also current harms. We could go to the next slide, please. When people hear the term reparations, their minds immediately go to that center point, financial. But let me tell you that reparations is, is much bigger than that. Reparations is also about acknowledgement, so acknowledgement of harm. It's also about being a, a, an apology. And of course, an apology is only as um, good as the actions behind it. So a, a, a polished, apology without action is meaningless. Resources, having meaningful resources is vitally important in, in this work and thinking about reparations, but it's also about creating opportunities. <clears throat> Pardon me. How do you create opportunities again to uh, correct and repair previous harms? But it's also about making up for lost time, creating opportunities that help to do that. So we'll go to the next slide. So if we think about reparations for the exploitation of our ancestors, so people of African descent across the country. And I did meet with a, a group of young people, young people of African descent from BC, when they heard I was coming to do this plain lecture, they reached out to my office. They, they wanted to meet with me in person. They were very disappointed that I wasn't uh, coming to BC, but we've had a meeting and I think we're going to be, end up doing some really uh, important work together. I think they're called the Black Bloc group, a phenomenal group of young people. So when we're talking about reparations, it's for the, the exploitation of our ancestors. 
So it's that enslavement and the history of enslavement, that history that Canada hasn't wanted to tell. But of course, now that we have Emancipation Day officially recognized across the country, Canada is, 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 is better positioned to tell that fuller history. But what happened after slavery was abolished, but anti-Black racism wasn't. And so we've had a history of segregation. And in Nova Scotia and in Ontario in particular, we had legal segregation. Schools were legally segregated. <clears throat> Pardon me. I've been talking too much today. My voice is going. <clears throat> then that led to this marginalization. And that marginalization means there's a lack of access. We've also had forced relocation. Many people know the story of Africville, but there are many more stories like that in different parts of the country. And of course, you have your own BC story, like Hogan's Alley, for example. But it's also about violence and murder. And, and we know there are so many stories. People have stories of horrific uh, violations of human persons and human dignity. And some of those ended up in, in terms of uh, violence. And, and those lay the conditions for uh, what we're seeing today. So the, the, the uh, lack of access to education. The fact that I'm the first in anything in this country, quite frankly, is an insult to all of my ancestors because my ancestors have been here since the 1700s. So why would I be first in anything? if not for the fact that my ancestors were denied opportunities that today we take for granted. Opportunities in education, which have an impact on employment and employability, and then all of those things. We, we think about the structural determinants of health. Um, and so you know, the impact on health, including mental health, impact on whole communities. We have communities that have been disenfranchised because of systemic racism, exclusion, the exclusion that happens. And again, the term violence, I, I, I'll come back to that. And we, it almost seems like today we're seeing more violence in our community than ever before. And we need reparations if we're going to see any of that change. So if you think about those five pillars in terms of reparations. If we want to build better futures, it's really about building stronger families. It's about creating uh, opportunities for, for communities to thrive. And how do we do that? Part of it is, is around employment and employability and giving people opportunities to actively uh, engage in their communities to actively participate in, in, in um, economic development, but also social economic development, giving people opportunities to practice health and wellness. So things like a guaranteed livable income and, and those kinds of things, if you think about the higher prevalence of people of African descent who are living in poverty and many who are living at the intersection of race and, and other uh, issues of discrimination, such as disability. And so you see the, the, the layers and the multi-layeredness of this. Ultimately, though, we're talking about inclusion and how do we get to inclusion? How do we get voices, those who are, those who are making social policy and those who are implementing social policy? to understand the needs for policies that are going to uh, lift people out of their current conditions, as opposed to forcing them into a cycle, a cycle of poverty, a cycle of unequal access, a cycle of missed opportunities. And that's essentially, that's the goal of reparations. So let's go to the next slide, please. So the, as I said, we're, we're in year nine of the decade for people of African descent. We go to the next slide. There are three pillars. Those three pillars are recognition, 
justice and development. Speaking specifically about recognition, it's recognition is about raising awareness, but it's also about building blocks to make our, our community more inclusive. But it's also about removing barriers. If you think about the barriers to equality and the barriers to equity. But this recognition work, the work of recognition, the goal of recognition is also about improving policies, having better policies that will address those systemic issues and facilitate empowerment, facilitate growth and development. And part of the way we do that in, in sort of recognizing and promoting African culture and African history, creating a sense of pride in our Africanness, as opposed to a sense of shame. My generation, when we studied history, we were a, a people of African descent were written out of Canadian history. And when there was perhaps a brief mention, the mention was very negative. The mention was uh, so negative that people didn't even want to, uh, didn't even want to consider themselves Africans because so much of what we were taught about the continent of Africa was the negativity, was negativity, was negative, was problematic, was problematized. And so we've had to learn. We've had to learn to embrace our full history. We've had to learn to appreciate our rich African culture. And this pillar as, as identified by the United Nations is basically saying to the whole world, this is important. This is an important step. The second step is justice. We'll go to the next slide. When people think of justice, they automatically think of criminal justice. And of course, that's a part of it. But it's, it's, it's really also about uh, identifying and combating racism in the law itself. So ensuring that we have laws that are stamping out um, racism and uh, anti-Black racism. It's talking about uh, fair access to legal processes, equal treatment in justice, but it's also acknowledging and apologizing for the historic anti-Black racism. It's also about seeking uh, social justice. It's also about seeking uh, economic justice. It's also about seeking justice in the education system, justice in health. So I encourage you to think about justice more broadly. It's not just about the criminal justice, although that's also a huge part of it. And then the third pillar, we'll go to the next slide. The third pillar is development. And so what do we mean by development? It's actually about creating those conditions and creating access to, to uh, address issues of poverty to look at issues of education and employment and housing and health, you know, the big issues that keep us in this cycle of unequal access. How do we break the cycle, break through the barriers so that, so that we're enabling the development of individuals and families and, and communities, whole communities. So it's about access, access to safe and secure workplaces access to safe and secure housing, access, access to culturally relevant healthcare, access to uh, positive and engaging educational uh, practices. And so those, those um, three pillars are very important and we won't get there. I, I would say this decade has just enabled us to put a pause and to look at these three pillars and to look at those three pillars and create action plans. Different provinces have created action plans around these pillars. Different organizations have created action plans. And I want to lift up the, the action that the Canadian Association of Social Workers and the Nova Scotia Association of Black Social Workers have done. 
in this regard. And I think this is a model. We'll go to the next slide. So we'll go right on to the next slide. So, so these two organizations came together, CASW and ABSW. And the first step was to um, join forces. So there was a historic agreement that was signed. That was pretty, pretty significant. Uh, an agreement to look at reparations in social work and the need for reparations in social work by recognizing and addressing systemic racism. And, and the organizations knew that together they could do this. We'll go to the next slide. What was our second step? The second step was identify what I'll, I'll call the dream team. And some of you may know uh, these folks. Dr. Dave Es, a professor emeritus from University of Cal Calgary, Faculty of Social Work, an African Canadian, and Dr. Chris Walmsley, a professor emeritus from Thompson River University, and a person that I would identify as a very strong white male ally. And as you'll see as we go through this conversation, that uh, allyship is an important component to this work. And I'll tell you, I, I think Dr. Walmsley is a good friend of Dr. George's and uh, he was the one that contacted me to say, I hear this is happening and I think you, you, I hear you've been invited to do this plain lecture and I hope you say yes. And so you can thank Chris, Dr. Chris Walmsley for me being here with you this evening. We had a research assistant, Aaliyah Campbell, and the CASW and ABSW provided support uh, to this team in, the, in conducting their work. And CASW especially were very, very gracious in terms of making the information available and accessible to the team as they were doing this work. We'll go to the, to the uh, next slide. So a, a huge part of the work was really their assessment. So how did they how did they do this? So they looked at the CASW website. They reviewed CASW annual reports, and the organization was very um, supportive in terms of making this information available. They created a critical milestones uh, template of African Canadian history to see well where is social work. Where is the organization in the African Canadian history? They reviewed Canadian social work texts, the core texts that we in social work education rely on. They also looked at um, the websites of some of the provincial colleges of social work. So what's going on in different provinces in this country? And they looked at a number of selected documents from the CASW. They also looked at uh, literature on reparations. So they were uh, particularly interested in academic um, literature on rep reparations, but they also looked at gray literature on reparations. So who's doing this work? Who's engaged in this work? What are the conversations around reparations and how are they relevant to social work? And they also reviewed the Association of Black Social Workers website, which is again, very important and critical to the work. And then we'll go to the next slide. The next step was the report. The report is available on both um, websites, the CASW and ABSW websites, and the report is there. This won't come as a surprise to you, but very clearly there was an absence, an absence of attention to addressing uh, issues of anti-Black racism, issues of, of relevance to the Black community until very recent years. And this is well documented in the report. So there's an absence from CASW, an absence from most of the provincial organizations historically, and also an absence in the literature. If you think about some of the some of the literature on social policy and Canadian social work and the history of Canadian social work, it's like we weren't there. We weren't present, we weren't visible. 
And clearly the needs of the organization, the needs of the black community were not being met. Through this work, we'll go to the next slide, please. Through this work, uh, Dr. Dr. Esther and Dr. Walmsley came up with um, seven recommendations. And, and these were, I think, very strong recommendations to the organization, but a strong suggestion that they provide uh, community education sessions, at least one to two per year, that it strengthen its relationship with chapters of the black social workers across the country, that they encourage uh, provincial associations in offering ongoing professional development around issues that are really, really important, such as the history of people of African descent in Canada, emerging issues that are impacting African Canadians, and also Afrocentric social work practice, which is gaining more prominence now um, across the country. We'll go to the next slide. They also recommended scholarships for social work students by the organization. And a recognition that CASW encouraged its, its provincial members to offer an annual award to African Canadian social work practitioners for their contributions to social work. Because they've been so invisible, we're trying to, the idea was to make them more visible. Uh, staffing, looking at targeted hiring when CASW is in a position to do so. And then probably one of the most important recommendations is the last one, uh, encouraging CASW and ABSW to continue the dialogue to determine what they will do next as two organizations. We'll go to the next slide. Dissemination and follow through. And uh, just, just hold back for one second. I'm, I'm proud to let you know that CASW accepted all of those recommendations and they are committed to uh, implementing them. CASW and ABSW uh, meet uh, quarterly, I believe. And when they meet, you know, they address issues and concerns that are mutual concern. And since this project, we now have an Alberta Association of Black Social Workers. And just two weeks ago, uh, the Saskatchewan Association of Black Social Workers was launched. And both those organizations have been supported by CASW, supported in terms of their development, supported in terms of even using their platforms to do their launch. And uh, just a, a, a strong commitment to do whatever they can do to assist those organizations. One of the other things that's happened since this work was uh, made public, the Canadian Association of Social Work Educators have invited us to speak at the upcoming conference um, in, um, in May, May, June, the annual conference. We'll be speaking on this uh, topic at the conference because although this project was uh, focused uh, with CASW was focused on uh, social work practice. There's also the recognition of the significance of this work for social work education as well. And that's where I want to go next. We'll go to the next slide. If we think about enacting reparations, if we think about recognition, justice and development, and we think about how other organizations can use this uh, model in their organizations. Uh, I, I think, you know, I can see this model being scaled up and used by others. So the decade, the UN decade is finished, but the work continues. And part of how the work can and should and must continue, I think needs to be about how we enact reparations in our respective um, workplaces how we enact reparations in our specific um, uh, schools of social work, you know, across the country. We, we can and must do more. And part of that, as Tim said earlier, 
part of that is, is recognizing the place of African Canadian history, recognizing the place of Black people um, across the country. And, and doing that and focusing on anti-Black racism doesn't take anything away from the work done with and for other uh, racialized, marginalized groups who experience discrimination because we're stronger together. And if we're doing this work in one space, it's, it's also a recognition of how important it is to do it in other spaces as well. So, so breaking down those steps, you know, what, what are those steps? One is acknowledging the harm caused by past actions and then having a commitment, not performative change, but a commitment to transformative change. I think we need to be thinking about transforming, transforming our spaces and places. And then you identify an action plan. Action plan needs to explore the issue. So doing that research and properly resourcing a team to do the work. This work, when we're talking about enacting reparations, that's not work that someone can do off the side of their desk. Dedicated resources need to happen. So again, that's one of those in terms of reparations is awareness, acknowledgement, um, and uh, resources. Um, the, the, once the team is in place, that consultation has to happen with all stakeholders. I think that's an important part of the work as well. And then when the analysis of the findings come together, coalesce in a report with recommended reparations. So that's going to look different in different contexts. At the end of the day, we should be thinking about these recommendations as reparations themselves. But recommendations are only as good as the commitment to make sure that they're implemented. So that commitment to action, that commitment for transformative change, and also identifying and committing to address the barriers to change. Because let's face it, you know, there, there, there will be, there are barriers to change. So how do we address those? What do we do to address those? And then creating an implementation, implementation plan, just as important is scheduling a, a periodic reviews. So doing check-ins, how is this going? How is it working? Uh, are there some pitfalls? You know, are there things we need to do to make sure we don't fall into um, creating even more barriers and not getting to the transformative kind of change that we want to see? Uh, we'll go to, the, I think the next slide is the Q&A. So thank you. Thank you for um, listening. And I look forward to engaging now in dialogue as we respond to the Q&A and we can just stop the PowerPoint. Thank you so much. Thank you, well, thank you. So there's a lot to, lot to think about there and a lot just, uh, you know, what was striking me as we were talking is, well, she's absolutely right. I don't ever remember having a conversation on this in all the years I've been around. So, so thank you for for engaging us in this this important discussion. Uh, I had meant to mention it earlier to to the audience. If you're welcome to put questions in the Q and A function at the bottom of the of the screen, and and Samir is going to try to curate and feed them to me. Uh, but maybe to kick us off, Patsy had a question here. So. How can these principles and recommendations be applied to other professions in Canada? Is it happening with any other groups? So. That's a really good question, Patsy. Thank you for asking it. I'm not aware of it happening with other groups. This, the, there almost seems to be a bit of a reluctance in this country to talk about reparations. And even though in in 2021, in April of 2021, we had a unanimous decision in the House of Commons to, rec to formally recognize 
Emancipation Day. And then in June of the same year, the um, Senate made a unanimous motion, voted unanimously as well to recognize Emancipation Day. And what, what I found um, disappointing and discouraging was that people saw that as an end piece because people have been fighting and lobbying and you know working to have rec to have emancipation day recognized for years i personally started working on that as one of the things one of the first things i started when i joined the senate in, um, in 2016 2017 so people were seeing this oh you know we finally have this recognition but then i want to say but so what what does it mean what does it mean to have Canada recognize Emancipation Day? Well, you know, you know, recognizing that there's been this history of enslavement of people of African descent and, and other people as well. But this particular um, uh, Emancipation Day is, is a recognition of that. But there has not been the work that needs to be done to look at so what needs to happen as a result of this acknowledgement. And that's the work that I think needs to be done. So I think, yes, absolutely. We could look at every profession. We could look at every profession and look at how do we bring uh, the model of reparations to different professions. I think it absolutely can be done. And one, one of the reasons for talking about this in this forum is to encourage that encourage other uh, faculties, other schools, you know, to look at this. And, and I want to encourage people to be bold, to be bold with their decisions and bold with their actions and creative with their um, community dialogue and conversations, have the difficult conversations. And then look at, so what do we do? How do we get to that action together? Okay, thank you. So we have another question from Professor Thorne. Uh, I loved your comment that reparations on behalf of one disadvantaged population group will always support such activities with other such populations. Do you have any further thoughts about how racialized communities might come together to strengthen action towards truly meaningful social change? I think that we've been so we've we've been so used to doing things in silos. So whether that's a silo in terms of what we do in our different communities, or even if you think about in social work, we have silos in social work. You know, there's the practice people and the policy people and the research people. We could actually be working more together. If we, we have a model that I think could be used to bring us working more collectively. So the federal government has an anti-racism secretariat. It's not an anti-racism secretariat for certain groups. It's an anti-racism secretariat. I think that that model, I think we could do more. They're, they're in the process of developing their action plan and there may be some positive uh, sort of direction coming out of that that brings us more uh, where we're working together to address issues of racism I believe to be quite frank that that's the only way we're really going to um, address these issues collectively as a country if we're doing it together you have to break through the silos and, and and would that would that extend to other groups as well? I know that you know in my work in disability, we we try to pay attention to intersectional issues, but that that we're often it, it seems like on some issues we we kind of get pushed back in our silos. <laughs> and I don't know whether you've had that same sort of experience. <laughs> There's some issues people are willing to work together on, and others they'll say, mm, "Yeah, I'm not so sure." I don't, has that been part of your experience? 
Absolutely, absolutely. My, my experience, to be honest, I, I, I really do believe in intersectionality and uh, try to bring that lens um, to the work. But in my experience, I have spent a lot of my time, it feels like knocking on doors to try to bring the Black community perspective in because it tends to be absent. And so people might see that I'm single focused. They may feel that it's a single focus. Uh, it's not that I'm single focused. It's it's typically that you know I'm I'm noticing an absence and I'm in a space where I I feel I have a duty and a responsibility to bring that perspective in because typically when I'm not in the space and I'm, and I'm often the only person of African descent or the only person of African descent that's bringing forward that sort of social justice lens. And if I'm not in the space, then that doesn't get mentioned a lot. I had a, I, there's a funny story about in my first or second year in the Senate, uh, I was on the committee on agriculture and forestry. And so people might wonder, well, you know, how do you bring a social justice lens to issues of agriculture and forestry? Well, ask me and my team, we did it every week. So there was one week when I was not able to attend the meeting and I had this very interesting email from someone who was following that particular study around food security. And in her in, in the email the person sent me, they said, you know, I noticed you weren't at the agricultural committee meeting on Thursday and, and those issues weren't raised. And I thought, wow, that's quite amazing that here's someone from somewhere in the country watching what we're doing and obviously had been following and, and paying attention and paying attention to the lens that I was bringing to that committee and noticing when I wasn't there that lens wasn't there either. And that's that's really stuck with me because it's made me just recognize um, how important it is to just raise these issues when they need to be raised, even though sometimes it can be quite exhausting. It, it's just a lot of resonances for me in around the disability work that that there there does tend to be a higher hierarchy amongst the powers that be and they they will address the big picture more prominent ones but the other groups can get lost i say unless somebody like yourself is there raising that but i i have a couple other questions now uh, before, before you go on, I sure. just want to I just want to mention one thing. You mentioned the hierarchy. And the hierarchy of oppression, I think, is is one of the things that we just have not been successful at dealing with. And I think that's part of what keeps us from being able to effectively work together. Mm -hmm. um, is that hierarchy of oppression? Yeah. Okay. Well, and, that, and that's a big question. Somebody else might want to jump in in the chat on that one because that, that it's a tough question. Uh, so Samir has a question. He's just wondering how can we ensure that there are dedicated resources available to support organizations in transformative change and ensure that the reparations can be implemented? I think raising awareness about the need for reparations, raising awareness about the um, the fact that reparations are old, you know, so creating education around that, and 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 being unapologetic about it. And I think the more voices we have, sort of highlighting the need for reparations, the better we will be served and be serving um, the country really. So having community, having uh, conversations like like these are very, very important. Bringing these uh, topics up in our classroom, very important. Hmm. Bringing these issues forward when we're having policy discussions, you know, very important. Okay, thank you. So, so we have a question from Leah now. 
Uh, it seems that Black Lives Matter was critical in the bringing black, anti-black racism into the public discourse. But the risk, as with all social movements, is that public attention can drift away. How do we maintain this focus and attention? You're so right. Um, I would say that the Black Lives Matter movement really took on momentum following the middle of the day murder of Mr. George Floyd by police officers and the way that was dealt with during COVID. And I remember I was on lockdown in Ontario looking after my grandsons because their parents were small business owners and they were in an essential service. So they, they, they still had to work every day. And so I was there providing that care and support for my, for my grandchildren. And I'll never forget the image of seeing so many people, people of all races, young people in particular, protesting because they were so angry. And you know, I know that part of that anger was just pent up because they had been on lockdown for so long. But there was also le legitimate anger and rage about the way in which Mr. Floyd was treated by police. And people spoke, people woke up, people woke up and people pledged support. A lot of good things came out of the witnessing of that. And I think that the way that we make, I keep saying, you know, let's make that, that was a moment in our history, but we want, it needs to be a movement. And the way that we make it a movement is we, we just address the unfinished business of addressing anti-Black racism in this country. It's the unfinished business of this country. You think about the number of other groups, and again, I don't want anyone on this call to think that I'm taking anything away from any of the other groups who've received apologies. Every apology that's been received has, has been deserve, deserving. People of African descent have not ever received an apology for the enslavement of our ancestors. And when I talk about this, I sometimes get a lot of negative criticism because there, there's a whole group of people who feel that should never, it's not necessary. Canada wasn't a country when the enslavement of Africans happened. And I think they missed the point of the multi-generational trauma, the multi-generational harm of the past, but also what's missing in terms of a critical understanding of, of why there's a, a request, a demand for an apology. That, that whole um, understanding of we have systemic inequality today because of that past. And so part of the healing journey that needs to happen needs to be rooted in that apology, that recognition. And even the United Nations, when they came to Canada, that was one of the things they recommended, that people of African descent in this country were owed an apology, but not just words, an apology that had some specific uh, meaning and specific actions are tied to it. I wonder if I could follow up a bit with that in a slightly different tact. I mean, one of the 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 horrific things that happened with the advent of the Black Life Movement was the the pushback south of the border, and the just the 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 stunningly barefaced racism that people didn't even feel the need to hide. They were on the streets. And and I know up here, we sometimes feel a little smug and think we're, well, we're not like them. Uh, but I'm wondering from your, your, you're in a unique kind of perspective in the Senate, what's your sense of, of Canada that as we start to 
to to push for reparations, to push for an apology. Do you think we will see that same kind of of sort of barefaced racism emerge? We're already seeing it, Tim. We are already seeing it. Uh, you know, there's there's a there's certainly a rise in uh, extremism, a, a rise in this notion of white power, and I think we we when we convince ourselves that it's really bad in the United States. We're also trying to say to ourselves, but we've, we're doing better here. And that's the same kind of rhetoric that we heard during the history, the history of enslavement, the history of movement uh, across our countries. The little that you hear in history about Black people coming to Canada was they came to the promised land because things were so much better here. But hey, wait a second, they weren't that, they weren't that good. <laughs> there, was, there were problems here, there was legal segregation. I went to a segregated school. Schools were legally segregated in our communities. We weren't allowed to go to schools. But at the same time, you'd hear, but you know, we treat our black people, well, they were, we weren't black then, we were colored. We treat our colored people so much better than they do in the States. The reality is that's not true. It's not as blatant. People are less reluctant to report hate crimes. And so we don't see it. It's not as visible, but believe me, it's here. I had an experience myself just a couple of months ago. It actually was my first week back after having been away on medical leave. I went for a walk to the Rideau Mall, which is the biggest mall here in Ottawa. I'm walking through the mall one morning, it's a Monday morning, uh, you know, at 11 o'clock in the morning, and a white male comes up to me and says, you know, I want you to know that I believe in segregation. And I was physically alarmed. I was alone in that part of the mall where we were, there were just the two of us. I felt afraid. I, I, I normally, I would engage in dialogue if someone said something like that to me. I didn't because I wasn't, I wasn't convinced that if I said something that I wouldn't be physically harmed. So I beelined it out of there. I saw people in a distance and I walked towards the other people that I saw, hoping that that would be a place of safety. And that when when that kind of trauma happens to you, uh, you relive that trauma. So I, I mean, I stay at the West and I go to that mall every time I'm in Ottawa and I think about that. So I'm reliving that trauma. And that's just one example. But these kinds of things are happening all the time in Canada. And so I think, yes, the more that we try to move towards more progressive policies, the more that we try to move, and, and this government, I must say, you know, this government has, has dedicated specific money in the budget to address issues with Black Canadians. They don't, call, they don't call this reparations. I think there's a fear to call it reparations. We need to be bold for change. We're not there yet as a country. Well, and Sally actually has a good follow-up question to that so if you well, I'll just read this and if you have things you could add she said so many countries in the world are moving in a more right-wing and intolerant direction what can our Canadian institutions such as the Senate do to ensure that Canada stays strong on a reparations agenda well I think the Senate would have to recognize that a reparations agenda is something we should be aspiring to we're not there yet as a Senate but that's part of the conversations that um, need to happen, that will happen, that are happening. We need to bring these issues forward. And uh, in the Senate, we have a platform from which to do that. But part of the, part of the work is um, helping others see that as well and see that as something they want to aspire to. Okay, so we have another question from Francis Cato. 
Uh, thank you, Senator Wanda, for the presentation. As a senator, as you think through and articulate the importance of reparations, should we also take interest in how countries like Canada engage with countries on the African continent? I believe this person is asking about reparations in the context of international relations. Oh, absolutely. There's so much work that could be done uh, in terms of um, uh, economic development, in terms of trade, international trade, in terms of the kind of work that we do with different African nations, there's so much that we can do. And if we do that work with that lens of reparations, if we do that work with a lens of, you know, what can we learn from each other? Canada has a pretty paternalistic attitude towards many um, African nations. And changing that would be one of the most important first steps, I think, in terms of the work that needs to be done um, to bring that reparations work to an international stage. But I also believe, you know, that we need to do our work at home before we jump into international work. I think there's a bit of a safety in terms of doing that work internationally as a first step, as opposed to doing the work at home. It's always a bit more challenging to turn that mirror around to look at oneself, right? Okay, thank you. So we, we have another question from Naomi Hudson. Uh, thank you so much for your lecture, Senator. As somebody who's been deeply entrenched in the anti-racism space for quite some time, I often find that equity and inclusion are viewed as a way to tick boxes rather than actually create lasting systemic change. What, in your opinion, can be done to combat this view and ensure that the anti-racism work that we engage in is, is actually has a lasting positive impact on our communities? Well, I think one of the most important things is actually through the development of policy. Policy that that lives beyond the government in power, right? Uh, so at, at every level, so federally, but also provincially. Um, I, I would absolutely agree with you. Far too many people see that ticking the checkbox as the, as the major approach to this work and we need to challenge that when we see it happening. And when we challenge that, I think that that you know, can help um, make a difference. And that's one of the things, if you think about those recommendations that um, Dr. S and Dr. Wamsley made to CASW, uh, many of those were things that they wanted to see implemented uh, not just in the short term, but longer term, so having that sort of longer term vision and not not just about checking a, a box to say, okay, I've done that, but really, you know, what are the kinds of things that are going to make a longer term impact to truly make a difference and to transform, transform social work, transform social work practice. And by extension, we're talking about transforming social work education. Uh, I have a question that it's a little bit change of direction, but I, I'm curious about the challenges that that Black Canadians have in building a national movement because it's it's an interesting diaspora, really. When you it, that. The African Nova Scotian community is is you know well recognized and say it's been there for hundreds of years, um, but in other communities you have the sort of the West Indian uh, migration in Ontario over the last forty years or so. Um, you have the refugee communities in, in the West, uh, and I I remember growing up in Ontario every farming community in southwest Ontario had a little community out away from the town mm -hmm. of the, the black workers. Now I I have a little bit of shame to say I have no idea what became of those communities. But but I wonder about the challenges of 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 building a pan-Canadian movement of, of of black Canadians 
that's uh, yeah, I, I, that's a really good question, um, Tim. So, in addition to the challenges you've identified, so our origins, how long we've been in the country, you know, some of the different realities we have across the country, and language is another one. So there's a you know gulf between the uh, uni language English and the uni language Francophones. Um, and so, you know, trying to create opportunities for people across the country to come together becomes a major, major undertaking. But last year, last year, um, the Miguel Jean Foundation organized a summit in Nova Scotia, and it was quite outstanding. And they lobbied for funding to bring young people together, in particular. Not that they were excluding the older people, but they wanted to make sure there were young people. And I, I think that was a really good strategy because what it did is it, it brought us to get together across age, across language, across our length of time in the country. And they came up with a, a wonderful um, sort of action plan that I think will be presented nationally very shortly because they want to make sure that all of those voices are included. And that's part of what they were doing at that summit. And I, I, I have a lot of hope, a lot of optimism around what will happen as a result of that work, that that summit, um, and that summit was held last year around Emancipation Day, actually. And so they it was bringing people together uh, around a topic they could really organize around. But at the end of the day, irregardless of how long we've been in the country, irregardless of where, we've, where we came from, and irregardless of what type of work we're doing, you know, whether it's in social work or education or policing or whatever, at the end of the day, the anti-Black racism is the unifying force that will bring us together and one of the things that I think is really important that we do within that broader context is actually look at look at our um, our realities at, from an intersectional lens as well. So looking at you know people of African descent who've who've been here for a long time, as uh, and also those who are you know more recent newcomers, looking at those who are from the LGBTQ community and how the, the raced queer experience is different than the raced straight experience. Looking at that from the perspective of gender, looking at that from the perspective of disabilities, how persons of African descent with disabilities are often excluded from conversations about anti-Black racism and what we can do to address anti-Black racism. And so recognizing that intersectionality is a part of what we must do as we come together to work on issues, but also looking at that unifying piece. And, and, and we will we'll only be effective in addressing anti-Black racism if we do it together. If we do it together, recognizing intersectionalities, recognizing how we may have different realities within that broader context, but ultimately, we must work together. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I think we'll make this the last question because I know it's late in Ottawa and you have a busy schedule. Uh, this just seems a fitting one to end on. So Patsy says, any chance of getting a committee on reparations by parliament? Oh, I love that idea. I <laughs> love it. I love it. <laughs> Committee on Reparations, yes. I, I love that idea, Patsy. And I, I think, you know, what a wonderful outcome from this conversation we've had this evening. Okay, well, on that note, I would just like to, to thank Senator Bernard for, for a really thought-provoking talk and one that I think it's exactly what we hope to do with these lectures that I, I, I assume I'm not the only one who's thinking, oh, well, what do I need to be doing? You know, can think about our school and, and how we need to, to, to be 
be thinking about this in a more more focused thoughtful kind of way and and so uh say you've you've done everything and more that we hope for the splain lecture and i i really appreciate you, you taking the time to be with us and sharing that and i suspect we will not be the last time we cross paths at least <laughs> i hope not and uh, just i'd also like to thank our our committee uh patsy and samir um it, it's it's not a huge amount of work but but there's work involved and and, and so and i think we enjoy it though <laughs> and <laughs> and uh mu for for walking us and in allowing the space for the lecture to happen so Without further ado, I'd like to thank all our participants and everybody who took their evening to to listen to what I, I know was an inspiring and, and thought provoking talk. So I will officially close the 2023 Splain Lecture. Thank you all. <laughs> thank you again for having me and for allowing me to do this virtually. I appreciate it. Oh, our pleasure.